Hello there. Today I wanted to talk about why there is such a disinterest on a population scale in our more recent spiritualities and mythologies. I've noticed in my comment sections from people who are not from the West, there's quite a bit of ignorance on the way the West has developed in the last couple centuries. Not from everyone, but it makes sense because it's a very peculiar situation the West finds itself in. There's not really any other, any other society on Earth that has gone through what the West has gone through in the way the West has gone through it in the last couple of centuries. So I thought it would be an interesting topic of discussion. A couple of my videos I've talked about ancient spiritualities like Asatru, Foreign Cedar, Celtic Reconstructionism, Roman Reconstructionism, and also more modern remakes of these spiritualities like Wicca. And I briefly alluded to the fact that these are fast-growing movements, which they are. But the kettle in which this situation has boiled is just as interesting as the movements that have bubbled up from it. So I wanted to talk about those situations, or the situation we find ourselves in. So I was reading a comment from an Indian gentleman today saying that he sees a lot of Westerners uh, coming to India seeking Hindu spirituality. Now, for him, this is a sign that in India is a superior or more interesting culture than the West. I genuinely don't believe that you can ascribe something like interestingness or superiority to a culture. Um, obviously, everyone's going to feel more at home and be a bigger fan of the things they're familiar with and the culture that they come from, as it should be. Well, I say everyone. Obviously not a lot of Westerners. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. So, I think it's important to distinguish or make clear why that's happening. Why there's Westerners going to foreign countries or staying in their own country and choosing to take on the culture, spirituality, and traditions of other nations. In my video, The Power of Myth, I talked about how the West has lost its belief in its common story. If you read Western writers even just a century ago, which is a blink in the time of human history, it's nothing, you'll find a much different candor and tone to their writings and their philosophies. There was a great deal of optimism in the West, we'll say a century and ten years ago, before World War I. There was this idea that we had something incredibly special to offer the world. That our traditions, our philosophies, and our way of looking at things were good, and that they deserved to be heard and spread. Now, of course, that's going to be a controversial idea to anyone who's not in line with these philosophies, traditions. But it's a sign of a culture that's healthy because much like a person who chooses not to procreate because they don't believe that the earth is worth siring children in, a culture who chooses not to procreate itself is quite depressed. I've alluded to the world wars and they really are the most significant portion of this. People who aren't Western, so most of the world, have a hard time understanding. And don't get me wrong, I understand that there's been horrific conflicts in other parts of the world. But nowhere else has that been mixed with a post-Enlightenment country and philosophy. So when you have something like World War I or World War II, devastating events taking place in the home soil of Europe, and then you combine that with a rationalist, materialist point of view. What you have is a sort of sharp and painful beheading 
of the spiritual center of a continent. A lot of men who were in the trenches, when they would be in the trench slash come home from the trench, they were quite spiritual, or at least they found comfort in those things. And of course, because it's the West, because it's Europe, they're going to go to the traditions of their fathers, and so they found comfort in the church. There was two waves of this. There was a wave of church attendance after World War One, and a wave after World War Two. Huge waves. But those men were broken. Their psychological centers were shattered. They weren't whole, and they weren't doing well. And so very many people in the West, myself included, who have uh, grandfathers and great-grandfathers who served in these conflicts, also have family stories of grandfathers and great-grandfathers who took to the bottle, who took to drinking very heavily, who lost themselves in that conflict and never truly came home. So that spiritual crisis, you can picture yourself being a child, being raised in a church. You go to church on Sunday wearing your Sunday finery, and then you come home and dad drinks himself into a stupor and verbally abuses you. Are you going to like or take to your father's traditions and spirituality in that situation? No. Now, was this everyone? No. But that's kind of a microcosm or an illustration of what happened to a lot of families. As well, if you layer on top of materialist scientific worldview, which, especially in the 20th century, it's very easy for people to forget that the West was most certainly the epicenter of that. It's only very, very recent that China became any kind of a scientific power. We're talking as recently as the 80s, the vast majority of Chinese people were farmers. This goes for every other major civilization other than the West. The Industrial Revolution started in England, and like a ripple, it went out into the world, and Europe adopted it at breakneck speed. Which brings me to another point. Starting in roughly the 1700s, 1600s, we had this whole fun idea of capitalism. This idea that what someone produces should be what they receive. Which sounds like another ideology. But if you think about it, that is capitalism. And so you had things like in England, little village boys who were being traditionally raised on farms with their fathers and mothers, being sent to the city, industrialized cities, to work in cotton mills, shipyards, etc. So that boy grows up separate from his family, separate from family connections. And that traumatization has been going on for centuries, right? I mean, we're still dealing with it. Again, in the West, almost everyone I know has a story or knows someone who has a story of the absent father or absent mother more recently, now that women are fully participating in this absolutely beautiful system of production. Again, other countries only more recently took to this, much more recently. India has only recently industrialized and it's still an ongoing process. India is famous for its blackouts, its brownouts. India is famous for failing infrastructure. This isn't all India is famous for, and there's a lot of great things going on in India. But modernity, as the West defines it, is a far newer innovation for them. Which means all these countries that are newer to it haven't quite tasted the bitterness that comes with all that sweetness. It's not all golden. The lifestyle, let's just pick on America, that America has comes from generations of men and women working 50, 60 hour weeks away from their families and separated from community. It comes from people having to move away from their parents hours and hours away to make it, to go to school. So when you layer that kind of situation for centuries on top of a series of devastating conflicts, the world wars were uh, par excellence for destruction but they weren't the first. Europe has a, um, 
mighty tradition of devastating conflict. It's a shame. What this isn't a sign of is a culture that never had anything to offer. What it is a sign of is a culture that no longer believes it does. So yes, Westerners go to India. Yes, Westerners convert to Hare Krishna. Yes, Westerners become Hindu. They become Muslim. They become everything. Are these traditions all bad? No. Do they have nothing to offer? No. But is it a sign of a culture that doesn't believe in itself? Absolutely. And maybe a little bit of the blame can also be said to fall on the doctrines of Christian churches. In the world wars, there was a lot of death. Duh, I guess. Um, and a religion that doesn't have a good story, message, or way of dealing with death is going to struggle in a situation like that. In a lot of cultures, when someone dies, there's some kind of concrete hope, and there's some sort of way that the people that love them can partake in the ceremonies and rituals of sending them off into the next life, whatever that looks like in that culture and religion. In the West, especially post-1500s, you've got a situation where the Western religion, Christianity, the dominant Western religion, is fractured into a million pieces. So you've got Catholics, then you've got Lutherans, then you've got Calvinists, then you've got Mennonites, then you've got Pentecostals, then you've got Reformed, then you've got da -da 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 -da. a million different ways. And so when these guys were in the trenches together, it's not like there was a lot of camaraderie, right? Especially with an Abrahamic religion, it matters a great deal to people the purity of belief that other people have. Whereas in, say, Hinduism, you have like, which I know is, a Hindu would say it's a way of life, not a religion. But in Western language and philosophy, there's really no other way to classify it. So that's what I'll call it. So in Hinduism, you have like a bunch of denominations, but they'll all call themselves Hindu. And especially because of the ire that Hindus and Muslims have between each other, yes, it exists. But the ire between Hindus and Hindus is far less than, say, Catholics and Lutherans. But this goes back to what I was saying. A lot of churches had no way of dealing with death. No proper way. Someone dies. If they're a Christian, they are going to heaven. All is honky-dory. If they're a flawed individual and maybe not so Christian, you know, no luck. It's just not a thing. It's not going to happen. Some key um, exceptions here would be, I mean, Roman Catholics, they're as large as every other Christian denomination put together all by themselves. There's over a billion of them. So it's hard to say that they believe anything because you have to almost, there's just so many Roman Catholics. But on a whole, Roman Catholics believe in praying for the dead, praying for the state of the dead, that they might make it into heaven. That's an example of a ritual that provides comfort to someone who just lost somebody. The idea that you can do something concrete to improve the situation and destiny of someone you love who died, who you never got to say goodbye to. So you go to church, you light candles, you pray, you pray, you pray. And if you have faith, they make it to heaven or have a much better shot than if you didn't do that. Whereas you have the totalistic kind of fundamental Protestantism you know, Jimmy goes off to war. Jimmy never really took his faith seriously or what have you. And Jimmy dies. And Jimmy goes to hell. And that's kind of um, all there is to it. So people lost faith. And they lost hope that this could comfort them or that it was real. There's something... I think a lot of cultures, as they interact with the West more, and as they become massive diasporas in the West, Indian, Chinese, etc., and they take on our post-enlightenment materialist worldview, you'll see all these things play out in these diaspora. I have no doubt. A lot of Hindus in India just super fundamentally believe in Hinduism, and I would never want to take that from them, nor do I think I could, nor do I think I should. But 
I just think it's interesting to observe because you can't see the Hindu realities playing out in the sense of like a chariot pulling the sun across the sky. Yet they believe. Whereas if you adopt a Western materialist worldview, it's kind of difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's it brings up a lot more questions than if you just accept the traditions handed down to you. This is the way most of humanity has always done it. European Enlightenment thinking is bizarre. Amongst humans, it's bizarre. So, I hope that kind of explains it. The West is culturally traumatized. Um, this doesn't mean every single Westerner is walking around bleeding inside or that Westerners are all weak. It's not that at all. But it just means on a cultural scale, on a mass scale, there is a problem of oikophobia, which is self-hatred. And uh, unless you understand that, you're not going to understand the current Western moment. And this is what caused and explains the neoliberal mess that a lot of people are kind of caught in, where their only belief is critique. Their only faith is in their own unworthiness, is in the fact that everything handed down to them by their fathers, like I mentioned in the Power of Myth video, or was it? No, that was in, uh, is Christianity the worst? Is that they just need to burn it all. Is that the nothing good came from the West, just a bunch of white men coming up with nonsense. Which is really funny because I think it shows how ignorant people are. And that, yeah, people don't read history. And that goes for a lot of people in a lot of countries. They don't read history. And they have a lot of opinions and very little to back it up. If you don't understand the West's history, our philosophical development, religious development, the reason why Westerners are the way they are, you're going to come up with wrong conclusions 100% of the time. Like saying that Westerners come to India to get involved in Hinduism because the West is inferior. It's such a uh, strange point of view. I think Hinduism is very interesting. I think a lot of philosophies and religions are incredibly interesting. I think the truths that do exist, that are uh, not just men babbling, show themselves in different ways, in different faiths. And there's also lies in different faiths. But I don't think it's somehow uber superior par excellence. Um, it's what it is. It's a tradition that involves a bunch of humans who make a mess of things, like humans do everywhere me included we're just trying to figure it out and essentially no one truly knows what the frick is going on in a sense i mean you know anyone who sounds 100 percent confident on things as massive as the nature and origin of the universe i do get a little shifty on it i just think a little bit of humility is required and approaching things with an even keeled Hungry, hunger for knowledge is wise thanks for listening it's a bit of a ramble but I think I expressed myself pretty well hope you guys enjoyed thanks for watching I'm incredibly grateful and I really enjoy making videos so I really appreciate you watching them have a good one